Jason Residlo reporting from inside the Detroit Marriott here at the Renaissance Center for the 40th Annual Automotive News World Congress. Stay tuned for an address by Mr. John Krafcek, former CEO of Hyundai Motor America. He's now the CEO of Google's self-car driving project. Today, um, It's great to be here. It's great for me to be back here, and it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces out there. Um, Casey, as it turns out, it's not Google guy, it's Googler. Um, we say Googler. Um, and I, I, love, uh, I love being a Googler. It's been a great experience, um, and it, it brings a lot of remarkable challenges along with it. And I want to talk to you guys about some of those challenges. Uh, but first, I have, I have a confession, and that is um, I still, I'm still watching what you all are doing um, via the monthly sales reports. And I got to tell you, you put together 12 great monthly sales reports in 2015, so congratulations on, um, on a great year. 17.5 million units is pretty amazing. Jason and I were talking about this last night. We had about 17.1 at TrueCar, and I think that was the industry consensus at the start of the year, so those extra 400,000 units. Pretty cool, pretty amazing. So I wanna tell you guys a personal story about how joining Google ends up being a homecoming of sorts uh, for me, and it's got an interesting personal special twist. See. Uh, you already heard this from Casey, but I started my career in the industry not so far from Google's, Google's main offices in Mountain View um, in a little plant uh, in Fremont called Numi, which was the GM Toyota joint venture way back when. And as a young quality control engineer, I was driving Chevy Novas and, and Toyota Corollas uh, ranging across the Dumbarton Bridge into Mountain View and in Palo Alto. And that means that um, right now, our Google self-driving cars are driving about on those same roads where I was as a young buck 30 years ago. That's pretty cool. But the twist is, uh, I've got a son named Alex. He's a younger, better-looking version of me who loves cars too, though. Um, he's finishing his degree right now at Reed College, and this past summer, he had the opportunity to be an intern at Tesla. And what's really cool is that his desk at the Tesla factory, which used to be the Numi plant, was about 100 feet away from where my original spot start was in the auto industry, which I think is sort of cosmic, sort of a cosmic thing. So like many of you guys, I love this industry. I, I eat it, and, and I breathe it, and I care a lot about it. I've been lucky enough to work for a lot of great companies, and I've done a lot of different things in the industry. I know, like you all know, that the automobile is the most complicated, mass-produced consumer product on the planet. So it's not surprising that this industry can inspire remarkable passion in the hearts and minds of those who care for it. And I consider myself one of those people. And from way, way back, I have really fond memories of things like my first real car, um, a 1973 Ford Capri, which I want to show you here. How about that? It's pretty sweet. Bikes on the roof. And I've still got a couple of fun cars in my garage. Um, I have, for my practical side, um, and thanks to the Volvo team for this car, I love this car. It's a, it's a Volvo V60 Polestar, it's my daughter. Um, for those delightful Sunday mornings on PCH or the Ortega Highway, I've got this right-hand drive um, Caterham Super 7. It's a great car. And Jason, your doppelganger car, an old 911 C2S. Jason and I share almost the exact same 911. So for pretty much my entire adult life, cars have been my work and my pleasure. So the question I get all the time is, how did a car guy like me end up with one of these? <laughs> this is my primary ride. Um, and I got to tell you um, first um, about my first couple of months at, at Google. You may have heard this, but new employees at Google, well, all employees are called Googlers, right, KC? And, and new ones are called Nooglers. Um, and one of the first things I got from Larry and Sergey when I arrived was this hat which I have to confess I haven't worn uh, with a little spinning propeller on top. Um, you'll note though, Jason, Casey, it's sitting on a copy of Automotive News. We read Automotive News at Google. Um, I just want to make the point that people over 50 at Google, and I am one of those, are also called Greglers. Greglers, but I don't want to go there. That's, that's a topic for another day. But four months in, I'm, I'm sort of past Noogler stage, and I think that's why they released me here. Uh, to share some of the stories uh, that we have to tell. So there are three things, three things that I'm absolutely convinced are very, very important relative to self-driving cars. 
Now, in the end, no one knows how all this will pan out, but I hold these three things to be true. First, for self-driving cars to reach their full potential, we must build them for everybody. Everyone, young or old, disabled or not, licensed or not, everyone deserves access to the technology that we're working on. The second point is the magic leap of technology has already been made. It's not science fiction anymore. It's fact. It's here. We've got to figure out the best way to use it. And finally, it takes many parts and many partners to make a self-driving car. We've learned this, and I'm going to tell you some stories about it. No one can do it alone. I'll introduce you to someone who's a friend of our program. Her name is Florence Swanson. She's a 94-year-old artist from Austin. And she provided that graphic work that you see on the side of that Google car in Austin. As part of our thank you, we gave her a ride in one of our cars. So at 94, she is the most senior person to have been in a self-driving car. And I'll tell you, her story really resonated with, with me because I've got a 96-year-old mom. And both her and Florence had to give up their licenses about a decade ago. And with that, they gave up that mobility, that personal freedom um, that the driver's license provides. Now, a fully self-driving car has the potential to have a huge impact on people like Florence and my mom. And the idea that we can provide an incredible person like Florence unrestricted mobility and give that same gift to my own mother who walks about a mile every day, it's pretty amazing, I think is a pretty special thing. Now, in the last two decades, we've seen a lot of change and a lot of progress in our industry. It's clear now we're evolving on a couple of key dimensions. Propulsion systems, which are becoming increasingly electrified, and operating systems, which are becoming increasingly automated. These are two huge vectors of change. Now, the industry has been making continuous incremental gains, but for self-driving cars to reach their full potential, we believe at Google that we must focus on nothing short of full autonomy. Now, why full autonomy? because mobility should be open to the millions around the world who don't have the privilege of holding a driver's license. Currently, there are over 40 million Americans over the age of 65, and that demographic is growing at a 50% faster rate than the nation's overall population. We can show that slide. 79% of seniors age 65 and older live in car-dependent suburbs or rural communities. And remarkably, 41% of disabled people work. 41% of the disabled actually work. How are they going to get to work? It's no surprise, then, we're seeing the growing popularity of ride-sharing services. We're seeing this everywhere, not just in the US. People are demanding different transportation modalities. And there's a huge opportunity for self-driving cars in this place to meet people's needs and make transportation easier and more accessible. Now, aiming for full autonomy not only reaches the most people, but our team believes it's also the safest approach. And having this audacious goal, the goal of full autonomy, is one of the things that really attracted me to the Google self-driving car project. I was surprised, however, to learn that that goal, to go full boat, full autonomy, wasn't always the goal. So let me take you back to the fall of 2012. After three years of developing the technology, we decided it was good enough to test out with a bunch of people who weren't working directly on the self-driving car project. So these were Googlers, but not self-driving car Googlers, right? Now, at the time, we were only testing on freeways. We were also, when we talked to these guys and sort of got them on board, we made sure that they understood that it was early stage technology you needed to pay attention 100% of the time when you got behind the wheel. Again, this is back in 2012. We learned so much, though, watching them in their interactions with the vehicle. It was pretty surprising. The good news is like, people really liked it. Um, we had car people. We had, we had one guy who was, was also a 911 owner um, who we didn't expect to enjoy this technology. Who did? He was a total car guy, but he enjoyed the fact that this took him away from the tedium of the morning commute. So that was great. 
But we also saw some things that were surprising and a little bit dangerous. Um, and these things scared us and gave us a different point of view. Um, there was one interaction that, that we recorded um, where the, the person in the driver's seat reached around into their laptop bag while barreling down the freeway at 65 miles an hour, took out their laptop, and hooked up their phone to get some, to get some charge on their phone. Pretty dangerous stuff. It's one of the things that we're really worried about. And when you think about it, it's, it's sort of the fundamental paradox of L2 and L3 systems. As they get better and better and better, humans are more likely to not pay attention in that driver's seat. But we need them to. We need them to be able to take over at any time. So in the end, we put those learnings together and, and came up with this idea that it made sense to develop vehicles that could drive themselves at all times with no human intervention. I'm absolutely convinced that for this technology to reach its full potential, it's got to do this. It has to shoulder the whole burden. That's the way we're wired right now in the Google self-driving team. We are all aligned on this point. And I want to make an interesting analogy here, going back to my time at NUMI and, and Lean Production. Bear, bear with me on this one. Having a driver on alert to take over an L2 or an L3 car is sort of like having a really big repair area at the end of your assembly line. Now think about that for a minute. Jay's nodding his head. He gets it. Both send a signal upstream that errors are OK. And if you're sending that signal upstream, errors are going to occur. That's this, that's this paradox, right? So again, if we need to rely on the driver in any way, the system will never be as robust as it needs to be. Now, the good news is that this magic leap of technology, as we've stated here, has been made. Now, people in history have been dreaming about self-driving cars for decades. In 1939, GM sponsored an exhibit at the New York World's Fair, showcasing a futuristic world with automated highways. And you've got to love this ad, right, uh, from the 1950s illustrating a future where you could play board games with your family while you were driving down the road in that crazy car with a glass dome on it. Man, that future didn't happen. They're playing, what are they playing? Backgammon. Dominoes, dominoes. But the reason why self-driving cars are now within reach is because we've gotten so good at our computers, our compute, our software, our sensors, coupled with our ability to activate machine learning. We provide myriad examples of a situation and literally teach a computer how to recognize those patterns. This is something that sort of makes sense um, for a company like Google and, and all the things that we've been up to over the last couple of decades. Um, it makes sense that we would be very good at this. Now, it turns out driving is a pretty complicated task. First thing, you have to know where you are in the world. So there we are. Then you have to see and recognize all the things around you. Now, that's made easier by our cameras, our lasers, our radar, all the sensors we put on the vehicle. You also need to understand things like speed limits, if there are any changes on the road, things like construction zones that might affect traffic. And even before you can move an inch, this is the hard part. You need to predict the future movements of everything in your field of view. And we've got about a 200 meter, um, 360 degree radius that we're looking at. Does that sound pretty simple so far? Um, then you got to move forward and predict the path. Now, we've been hard at work for seven years building the software. And we're pretty confident now that our cars can handle the majority of usual as well as unusual situations in the two countries in which we're testing. Uh, we're testing in California and Texas. I say two countries <laughs> to get a joke. We're in Mountain View in Austin. And right now, we're driving 10 to 15,000 miles every single week on public roads. If you put it all together, we have driven 1.3 million miles autonomously as a program team. It's pretty cool. It's amazing now to see our cars navigate four-way intersections without traffic lights. We've sort of figured that one out. It's a tough one. We can understand the subtle hand gestures now of cyclists and policemen at intersections. Um, and we can make perfect turns now out of tight cul-de-sacs. Not a trivial thing for a self-driving car. So 
I want to show you now one of the team's all-time favorite encounters. Like, this is, this is classic. This is in the category of you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Sometime last year, one of our vehicles was driving through um, Mountain View, and this is what we saw. I want to run this thing twice because you, there's a whole lot going on, and I want you to appreciate what's happening. Let me set it up by saying it's a woman in an electric wheelchair, no kidding, holding a broom, chasing a duck in circles on the road. No kidding, this was real life. Let's see if we can get that to run. See the lady in the wheelchair with the broom? That's the duck. She's chasing it. Our little car is wondering what the heck is going on. She continues to chase the duck. She holds the broom. Boom. And I wonder if we could run that one more time because it is so much fun. It's the duck, the lady, the broom, the electric wheelchair. Can you believe it? I mean, it's true. You, you literally could never make that stuff up. And honestly, there was no single line of code in our massive algorithm that in any way specifically predicted that event, right? There, there was no such thing. Um, there was nothing that said, we got to find this duck. Um, but our, our car still knew what to do, right? It understood that this was a situation where it needed to slow down, observe the situation, wait till the situation was clear, and then continue on its journey. There was one thing that we didn't do that we think a human would have done in that situation. We think a human would have gotten out their cell phone, taken a picture of it, and posted it to their Instagram account. We didn't do that, although we may be working on that technology. So it, it, it's a key point, though, to keep in mind for all of this. It is sort of funny, but it's very real. And the very real point is we've got to be out on public roads testing this technology. It's absolutely imperative. You would never have imagined or envisioned a situation like this on a test track. And we do have a test track, and we do throw a lot of things at the vehicle. Honestly, this one we never would have envisioned, right? So in addition to all of that testing on the road, 1.3 million miles so far, 10 to 15,000 miles um, on a weekly basis, every single day we put through our simulators, our powerful simulators at Google, the equivalent of 3 million miles of testing every single day. That's how we're learning. That's how we're training the machines in our machine learning algorithms. And it means that every day we're becoming more and more confident in the progression of this technology. To put 1.3 million miles in context, 1.3 million miles is the equivalent of 90 years of human driving. Um, there aren't a lot of human drivers who have had 90 years of experience. But if there were, you would imagine that they would be pretty good drivers, right? And the benefit of our technology is we can take all of that learning and share it across all of our vehicles instantaneously. So one of the things that we wanted to understand is how do our vehicles do in the real world? And, and one of the things you may have seen recently is we've recently commissioned um, a study with the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, VTTI, which looks into the true rate of crashes on roads. And it's pretty good data for us. It suggests that our self-driving cars operating on more challenging urban and suburban roads are involved in about a quarter fewer crashes than human-driven cars in their typical mix of urban and freeway driving. It's really impressive data, and it's really good data because, as, as you guys know, and as, as, I've, as I've shared with you here today, our focus has been in suburban and urban environments of Mountain View and Austin. Right now, we're really